this is Pastor Rick, and I want to welcome you to the Sunday Forum on this Sunday, October the 24th. Happy that you could join us for the Forum, where we are going to talk for two weeks straight, yes, two weeks straight, straight on the topic of the priesthood, or what is a priest? And this is important, and the reason we're doing it for two weeks is we're leaning in to Reformation Sunday at the end of October, October the 31st. The Reformation Sunday happens right on that Sunday. And one of the central themes of the Reformation is that we are all called to be priests, the priesthood of all believers. As Lutherans, we've heard that phrase ever since we were children. And ever since we were children, we've had no idea what that means. I mean, that's the problem. And yet it was a big move for Martin Luther and the Reformers. As you notice, we don't have priests in the Lutheran Church, unlike the Roman Catholic Church, who has priests offering sacrifices, which is the Eucharist for them, the communion. And even Anglicans and Episcopalians call their pastors priests. And the Reformers, uh, the Lutherans in particular, said, no, we don't have our pastors as priests because Everyone is called into the priesthood. We are all called to work in our daily lives. And so we want to talk about, again, where this idea of priesthood comes from, what are its roots in the Old Testament, and then how does it apply to us as the disciples of Jesus Christ. Again, two-part series. Uh, we'll show two videos today on the priesthood in the Old Testament and Jesus as priest leaning into next week which is the Reformation. So now let's take a quick look at this first video, which traces the idea of priesthood back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they're called to till and keep the garden, extending it into Abraham, who remember offered up Isaac. And finally, this strange figure that we'll be hearing about, especially as we read Hebrews uh, for the next couple of weeks in church, this king priest, Melchizedek. Now, let's watch the video. We are walking through the story of the Bible, focusing on the role of priests. And that story begins with God creating a garden called Eden. Where heaven and earth are one. And God places humans in the garden to be his royal image, his priests, so that humans and God can work together as one. And this whole setup is called God's blessing. But tragically, the priestly humans are duped into rebelling against God and then exiled from the garden. But God promises that one day a descendant will come to defeat that evil deceiver and restore humanity as royal priests. And we learn he'll be both a priest and a sacrifice. But as it stands, humanity is outside of Eden and things have spiraled into chaotic violence. But God chooses from the wreckage a couple, Abraham and Sarah. And God calls them to journey to the land of Canaan, and he promises to give them a huge family and all the blessings of Eden. Now, the blessing isn't just for them. The goal is that God's blessing flows through their family out to all the nations. And so that makes Abraham's family like a priesthood. So is Abraham that royal priest we've been hoping for? Well, no. But Abraham does meet a mysterious figure who reminds us of that promised royal priest. And who is this? Well, Abraham is returning victorious from a risky battle, and he passes by the city of Shalem, and this king comes out to meet him. And we're told that this king is also a priest who serves the same God that Abraham does. Ah, yes, Melchizedek. This man's a mystery. We don't know why he worships Abraham's God. We don't even know his family lineage. Exactly. But here's what happens. Melchizedek brings this great feast out to Abraham and his army, and then he gives God's blessing to Abraham, saying God is the one who gave him this victory over his enemies. Then Abraham gives Melchizedek one-tenth of everything that he has, and that's the story. So what is it all about? Well, Melchizedek is the king and the priest of Shalem, which is an ancient name short for Jerusalem. Ah, Jerusalem, which will later become the capital of Abraham's future family, where the temple is built. 
And that 10% that Abraham gives Melchizedek, that's just like the 10% Israelites will later give to honor the priests who work in the temple. Exactly. And so here is Abraham, the father of the Israelites, and he's honoring a royal priesthood that existed long before Israel's temple or their priests. Ah, Melchizedek. Yeah, he's super important. And we'll come back to him when we get to the story of David. Okay, back to Abraham. We find out that he and Sarah are unable to have kids. And they're really old. So how are they going to have a family? Well, they scheme up their own plan. Sarah forces her Egyptian slave to produce a child with Abraham. But once that happens, Sarah ends up despising her slave and oppressing her. So instead of trusting God for a family, they do it on their own terms. Right. And so God eventually does give them their own son, Isaac. But then God promptly asks for the life of that son back. Abraham is called to offer up Isaac on a mountain as a sacrifice. And we're told this is a test. God's requiring Abraham to own up to his failures, to stop his scheming, and to surrender his family's future to God. Abraham and Isaac go up the mountain, build an altar, and right as Abraham is about to offer up his son, God stops him, and he provides a substitute ram that can be sacrificed in Isaac's place. And here, the narrator stops the story and starts speaking to you, the reader, saying, This is why we today say, on the mountain of Yahweh, it will be provided. The mountain of Yahweh, that's Jerusalem. That's right. And so notice, in both of these stories we've looked at, Abraham is near that high place that will later be called Jerusalem. In the first story, Abraham meets a royal priest. And in the second story, God provides a substitute sacrifice that covers for the sins of Abraham's family. Yes, and both of these stories point forward to the need for a future royal priest who will also become a sacrifice for the sins of Abraham and his family. From here, Abraham's family grows to become an entire people, but they eventually end up as slaves in Egypt. And so, how can a group of slaves produce a royal priest? Exactly. Wasn't that a great video where it lifts up again this theme of priesthood? Again, we took a look at Adam and Eve, This initial role of being priests within the garden, and then Abraham fulfilling this same role, called to that role, and then Melchizedek, this fascinating figure who plays a real strong role in this week's reading in Hebrews 7 uh, that we'll take a look at on Sunday during worship. Now we want to, again, remind ourselves that we're trying to lift up the role of priest because we've been called to be priests, and this became one of the major themes and emphases of the Reformation. But before we move into our call as being priests, which we'll talk about next week in Reformation Sunday, let's take a look now at Jesus, who is the role model for being a priest. Enjoy the video. We've been exploring the theme of the royal priest in the Bible. We started by looking at Adam and Eve, who were called to represent God and rule over creation as his image. Ruling and representing God, this is the ideal role of a royal priest. But tragically, they're deceived by a creature, they abandon their calling, and so humans are exiled from Eden and fill the world with violence. But all is not lost. God promises that one of their descendants will come to intervene on their behalf and restore the blessings of Eden. A new priest to restore the failed priests. He's going to strike that deceiver while being struck by it. He's like a royal priest who becomes a sacrifice. Now through Israel's story, God raises up many people who could have been this royal priest, like Abraham, Moses, and David. And they all fail. But their stories point forward, anticipating the ultimate royal priest. And this brings us to Jesus. Now, in the time of Jesus, the people of Israel were ruled by the Roman Empire, but they were governed by their own priests, including the high priest who worked in the Jerusalem temple. The high priest was the only one who could enter the most holy space, and it was separated by a thick curtain embroidered with images of cherubim. And the high priest at this time was a man named Caiaphas. He is the one who currently represents the people before God. 
But then Jesus came onto the scene. And when we're introduced to Jesus, he's outside of Jerusalem at the Jordan River getting baptized. The skies open up and God says, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am very pleased. Now, these words blend together three statements from the Hebrew scriptures that are all about the coming royal priest who will be the king that God promised to raise up from the line of David and also the beloved son like Isaac was to Abraham. And he's the suffering royal servant of Isaiah who dies for the sins of his people. This baptism is like his ordination as a royal priest. Right. And so it's no surprise that afterwards Jesus starts going around acting like a priest. All right, like forgiving people of their sins or restoring people who were impure so they could enter the temple. These are the things that the priests who work in the Jerusalem temple were supposed to be doing. But Jesus is doing it outside their authority. And so they start to see him as a threat. And so this leads to a story where Jesus goes up with some friends to a high mountain and there he's transformed. He starts shining and all of his clothes become pure white. This is like the vision Moses had of the ideal high priest. Yeah, exactly. Jesus is here being revealed as the ultimate royal priest. And it's here that Jesus decides that he's going to Jerusalem, even though he knows that he'll get killed. And so later, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he challenges the authority of the current priesthood who are running things in the temple. Like when he storms in and disrupts the sale of animal sacrifices. Yeah, this is his way of showing he's the priest in charge. And then later he's asked, who do you think you are? And so Jesus responds by quoting from Psalm 110 in Israel's scriptures. This is the Psalm where King David speaks of someone that he calls his Lord, someone greater than him who will rule as a royal priest. Jesus is claiming that he is that priest. This makes the priests in Jerusalem angry. So they have Jesus arrested and they put him on trial before Caiaphas, the high priest, who asks Jesus, are you the anointed one? And what he means is, are you the royal priest? Because right now that's my job. And Jesus responds once more by quoting Psalm 110, saying, I am, and you are going to see me ruling at God's right hand. But actually, we're about to see Jesus get killed. How is that ruling as a high priest? Well, remember from Israel's scriptures, the pattern of the royal priest who surrenders himself as a sacrifice. Jesus is saying that offering his life for others is the way that he's going to ascend his royal throne. When Jesus died, the curtain in the temple tore in two. And God's own life presence, the blessings of Eden that were once guarded and separate, now they can flow out of the temple to fill all of creation. And when Jesus comes alive from the dead, he appears to his followers and commissions them to go out to the nations. So that they can share the good news that Jesus is the ruling king and priest who's going to restore the blessings of Eden. This is why the apostle Paul called Jesus the new Adam. He's inviting us back into Eden to become like him. So that we can take up our lost calling of being God's royal priests. <laughs>